It was in a garden ages ago that paradise was lost. And it is in a garden now that it would be regained. But Mary Magdalene doesn't know that yet. For her, her hope has been crushed underneath the hobnail boot of the Roman Empire. Her hope was Jesus. He had changed her life, and she had followed him ever since. He had cast seven demons out of her, freeing her from untold torment. He had given her life, a reason to live, a place in his kingdom. He had given her worth and dignity, understanding, compassion, love. And he had given her hope. Now that hope lies at the bottom of her heart, flat and lifeless. But something is there that helps her survive the cruel boot. Something resilient that springs up like a blade of grass after being stepped on. That something is love. Love is what brought Mary to Jesus' cross. And love it was, is what brings her now to his grave. But as she wends her way along that dark garden path, she stumbles upon a chilling sight. The stone has been rolled away. The tomb has been violated. Just when she thinks life couldn't get any worse, it gets worse. The night gets darker. Her hope grows dimmer. As she runs to tell the disciples, a legion of questions haunts her. Who took the body? The Roman government? The religious leaders? But why? What would they want with it? Have they given him to the dogs by throwing him outside the city in the garbage dumps of the Valley of Gehenna? Have they put him on display to further mock him? She finds Peter and John, and in breathless fragments, she reports what she saw. They rip through the night on a ragged foot race to the tomb. Mary tries to follow, but her side is splitting. She will catch up, she tells herself, when she catches her breath. His lungs burning, Peter stoops into the caved entrance. The wings of the dove gray dawn have extended a soft feather of light into the cave. As his eyes adjust, he takes careful notice of the burial wrappings made rigid by the resin from the spices. The linen cocoon lays intact on the stone slab. Intact. But hollow. Doubt and faith swirl in their minds like a heady wine as they stumble their way through the dark. Mary is left behind. Tears, her only companions. She takes her tears with her as she enters the tomb to take a look for herself. And suddenly, the woman who once was possessed by demons finds herself in the presence of angels. One stands at the head of the stone slab the other at the foot. Like the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place of the tabernacle, cherubim at either end. For this too is a most holy place. She is despondent as she tells them the reason for her tears. Then from behind, another voice calls out to her, why are you crying? She wheels around. Maybe the morning is foggy. Maybe tears blur her eyes. Maybe Jesus is the last person she expects to see. Whatever the reason, she doesn't recognize him. That is, until... Mary... She blinks away the tears and can hardly believe her eyes. Master, 
She throws her arms around her, the Lord she loves so much. She had been there for him when he was suffering on that cross. Now he is there for her in her suffering. She had stood by him in his darkest hour. Now he is there for her in hers. He had seen her tears. And now he is there to wipe them all away. Jesus interrupts the embrace to send her to the disciples with the good news. He is risen. I have seen him. I have touched him. He is alive. And so, too, is her hope. In his triumph, Jesus could have paraded through the streets of Jerusalem. He could have knocked on Pilate's door. He could have confronted the high priest. But instead, the first person our resurrected Lord appears to is a woman without hope. And the first words he speaks are, Why are you crying? What a savior we serve. Or rather, who serves us. For in his hour of greatest triumph, he doesn't shout his victory from the rooftops. He comes quietly to a woman who grieves, who desperately needs to hear his voice, to see his face, and feel his embrace. Father, we thank you, for you are indeed the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our times of weakness, in our times of need. You comfort us so that we can comfort others around us who are going through trials, times of pain, and we thank you for that. And God, in this Easter season, we remember all of your suffering the suffering that was given to you on our behalf. You died and you took the penalty for all of our wrongdoing. But we thank you even more greatly because you did not stay dead. You rose from that grave and conquered death, made it possible for us to have new resurrected life just like you. And you fill us with your spirit as we trust you. And you help us in the day-to-day -day -to life. You give us peace. You give us hope. And we ask you today, please help us to live in that hope and remember you this day and know you more and more. It is in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.